And aren't you a bit nervous about chilling on this air mattress dangling above the ground? Mark, Thomas's buddy, nudged him in the shoulder as soon as he touched down. Hey, if you're scaredy cat, you probably shouldn't dare to tread in the woods. Thomas grinned, laying the paraglider down on the grass to make sure it could be picked up without getting all tangled up. Thomas and Mark had been leading adrenaline-seeking tourists on mountain adventures for five years. These guys had tackled everything that could get their hearts racing and legs shaking. Rafting, bungee jumping, mountain biking, epic hikes, and even mountaineering. But what really captured Thomas's attention was paragliding. He practically spent the entire summer up in the mountains, soaring through the air, experimenting, honing his skills, and yes, even enduring a few mishaps, like the time he dislocated his elbow after snagging his paraglider on a tree and taking a tumble from a few meters up. Thomas began leading tourists only after he was fully confident in his own abilities. Mark took charge as the driver and organizer, while Thomas handled the coordination and execution of extreme entertainment activities. Come on, Thomas, enough with the extreme antics. If you take a spill from that height, you'll be a goner, scolded his mother, Mrs. Ehrlers. But that was just Thomas's way of living. To him, it was a hundred times better than being cooped up in a stuffy office, endlessly poking at buttons. Dangerous, sure, but so what? Thomas shrugged. These days, someone sneezing in a public place might be more dangerous. Should I just stay cooped up indoors? Of course not. No wife, no kids in the picture, Mom. Why keep bothering me about this? Thomas sighed wearily. The lectures about the risks of paragliding and the perceived lack of seriousness in the tourist business were a regular occurrence, despite the fact that it brought in decent money. You've got a great education, Thomas. Why not go work at a law firm, build a career? His mother persisted. And what about when you have kids? Will you still be off gallivanting in the mountains? One winter evening, Thomas was bored, mindlessly scrolling through his social media feed when he stumbled upon the profile of a pretty girl named Brittany. They went on a couple of dates, and the girl was impressed by Thomas's boldness and passion. Later, he took her on several trips, even offering to take her paragliding, but the cautious Brittany declined. Things moved swiftly, and less than nine months later, he popped the question. Thomas didn't mind that his chosen partner was somewhat spoiled and whimsical. After all, she always awaited him at home and never criticized his hobbies. The man was thankful for that and didn't mind that Brittany wasn't working. Let her do as she pleases, he told his mother. I make enough for both of us. Meanwhile, life was unfolding at its own rhythm. Thomas and his wife had been living together for a year and a half. Thomas's mom handed over her two-bedroom apartment to the couple while she used her savings to purchase a small house in the countryside. Moving in, she made it clear that grandchildren were expected soon. Thomas chuckled at the notion, while Brittany, with an eye roll, made it clear that kids weren't part of her plans for at least the next century. Despite the cautions about Thomas's flying hobby ending badly, Destiny had different ideas. As they headed back from the mountains in late August, the weather turned rainy and dreary. Mark carefully maneuvered the minibus, taking each turn of the winding road with caution. Meanwhile, Thomas, exhausted from the packed schedule and early start, drifted off to sleep in the passenger seat. In an instant, Everything changed when a reckless local driver unexpectedly appeared on the opposite side of the road. Mark swiftly turned the steering wheel to avoid a collision, causing the minibus to tip over and collide with a pillar and concrete barrier. Thomas found himself trapped, almost folded in half, between the roof and the dashboard. Luckily, the other passengers sustained minor injuries, including cuts, bruises, and a couple of broken fingers. Mark suffered a dislocated arm and a concussion. 
Emergency responders dedicated nearly 40 minutes to rescue the unconscious Thomas. He was promptly transported downtown for urgent medical care, providing hope for his survival. Although the surgery was successful, Thomas was left paralyzed from the waist down. The accident not only robbed Thomas of his mobility, but also his beloved job. Brittany grieved the loss of their once beautiful and comfortable life. Her perception of Thomas shifted almost instantly. No longer seeing him as a hero or a pillar of support and leadership, she now regarded him as a burden. Thomas endured a prolonged crisis following the loss of his mobility and sank into a state of depression. The doctor prescribed a set of exercises for Thomas, which were expected to have a positive impact over time. However, due to his frustration and sense of helplessness, he struggled to muster the motivation to begin them. When Thomas welcomed his wife back from work, Brittany's mood was far from pleasant, as had become typical lately. Her routine involved early mornings, a full day of work, managing household tasks, and caring for her disabled husband. How was your day? Thomas queried, finding it difficult to wrestle the bag of groceries from her grasp. Terrible, Brittany retorted sharply as she removed her coat. Thomas headed to the kitchen, setting the grocery bag down by the refrigerator before opening its door. Hand that over, otherwise you'll end up dropping something for sure. Brittany snatched the milk from his grasp. Why are you being so rude? Thomas glanced at her with reproach. And who do you think would clean it up, you? Brittany hissed back. She felt frustrated with her accommodating husband. He recognized his limitations and endeavored not to cause undue inconvenience for his wife. Initially, Thomas felt ashamed, but eventually, he came to terms with his situation and ceased tormenting himself with guilt. There are some cooked meatballs in the bag. Heat them up yourself. I'm tired, Brittany announced wearily, pressing her temples with her hands as she headed into the bedroom. Collapsing onto the edge of the bed, she felt utterly exhausted, drained, and devoid of energy. This wasn't the life she had imagined when she married the handsome, athletic, and adventurous Thomas. Now, he was deprived of his hobby and income, leaving her to work for both of them. She found herself running all over the city, showing cheap apartments to struggling families. It wasn't the way Brittany had envisioned spending her youth. Her hubby had been in the wheelchair for a solid six months now. At the start, they coasted by on their savings, but soon enough, they were flat broke. Brittany just kept putting off getting a job. At 25, she hadn't racked up much in the way of work experience. She dabbled in part-time modeling for online clothing stores and ran a stylist blog. Not bad for someone with a solid education in hospitality, though. Brittany's real estate gig wasn't exactly smooth sailing. Right from the get-go, everything about it got on her nerves, dealing with difficult people, navigating through confusing payment processes, constant running around, endless phone calls, and the never-ending need to persuade and bend over backward for someone. What made her stay in such a crappy job? It was all because of Fred, the smooth-talking boss who owned the real estate company. Brittany got swept up in Fred's charm when she stopped believing in the doctor's rosy outlook for her husband. In Brittany's head, it was always a tug-of-war between doing what she felt she should, her emotions, looking out for herself, and her conscience. And tonight, her own desires and selfishness won out. Brittany finally got to a place where she didn't give a damn about what anyone else thought. She realized she didn't want to spend her life babysitting her disabled husband until they hit retirement, wiping out her own happiness in the process. She deserved to be happy, to enjoy being a woman, not just some responsibility-laden workhorse. It was a snap decision. Are you going somewhere? Thomas inquired, observing his wife as she packed their belongings into a bag. Yeah, Brittany nodded anxiously. We're heading to your mom's. Thomas raised an eyebrow in surprise, his lips curling into a grin. What's this? The daughter-in-law actually wants to go to her mother-in-law's house? I'm done with this, okay? 
I just can't do it anymore. I'm young. I'm hot. I want romance. I want a decent guy by my side. I want love and affection, not playing nursemaid to some damn invalid. Brittany, I'm getting out of this damn wheelchair. Thomas interjected, his tone laden with despair. The doc said there's a chance. But what if you never get up, man? I'm just so damn tired. Brittany chucked a few more teas into the bag and zipped it up with a swift move. You're crashing at your mom's. We need a break, at least for a bit. Like, maybe six months, I don't know. It was a chilly morning in the village. Sparrows chirped happily as they hopped about. The ground was coated in frost. Brittany swung open the gate and guided the wheelchair down the narrow path to the porch. Thomas's mother emerged at the door, wrapped in a thick shawl. Planning on sticking around for a while, Brittany? Mrs. Ehrlers asked, giving her son's jacket a quick brush to remove any imaginary snowflakes. Thomas will be staying here for a bit, but as for me, I'll be heading back to the city. You know, work calls, Brittany replied with a forced politeness. Before Mrs. Ehrlers could respond, Brittany bit her goodbyes, closed the door, and made her way back to the cab. Two months had slipped by, and the end of March was looming closer. Throughout this period, Brittany never returned for Thomas. At first, he reached out to her himself, calling and messaging. But as time went on, his wife stopped answering the phone and responded curtly on social media. Thomas came to the harsh realization that she had callously abandoned him without a shred of remorse. His mother shook her head, troubled by the apartment her son had left behind. Nice move, Brittany, Mrs. Ehrlers sighed. First she dumps you on me, and now she's cozying up in my apartment like she owns the place. Thomas, it's time to file for divorce. Mark my words. Mom, everything will sort itself out. Just quit it. Thomas waved off his mother's persistence though his confidence in his own words waned with each passing day. Apathy and longing consumed Thomas. He wrestled with his own sense of helplessness, finding himself unable to tackle most of the household chores. Walks became a rare occurrence, as navigating the wheelchair down a couple of porch steps proved to be a challenge. Once, while Mrs. Ehrlers was grappling with the wheelchair, her elderly neighbor, Mr. Finsterwald, peeked over the fence. Oh, Mrs. Arlers, why are you lugging him around? The old man shouted indignantly in his straightforward manner. Hello, Mr. Finsterwald, the woman greeted sharply. And how do you propose we handle this? You could offer some assistance instead of just wagging your tongue. The neighbor, agile and far from senile, quickly approached and helped lower the wheelchair down the steps. Simultaneously, he inquired about what had happened to Thomas. Oh, blast it all! Mr. Finsterwald scratched the back of his head, adjusting his knitted cap with a grizzled hand. But I reckon I've got a plan. Tomorrow, I'll swing by and rig something up so you can maneuver in and out easier. But it'd be best if you could get back on your feet, once and for all. Son, eh? Thomas gave a slight smile and let out a sigh. After work, Brittany plopped onto the couch with her laptop. Without even glancing, she swiped away a message from her husband with yet another annoying question. Today, Fred, the boss of the real estate company, finally clocked her and asked her to grab coffee at lunch. Guess all those short skirts and hours in front of the mirror paid off. Brittany's determination to seduce the owner was pretty commendable. She tagged along with her boss to a coffee shop and made it crystal clear that she was up for keeping the conversation going in a more laid-back setting. Fred got the hint, and by the end of lunch, he asked the pretty employee out to dinner at a restaurant later in the week. His suit is clearly tailored, Brittany muttered to herself, looking at photos of her boss on social media, and he has designer watches and cufflinks. Her eyes glowed with admiration, but also with a sense of self-satisfaction. 
Ever since she pawned off her husband onto her mother-in-law months ago, Brittany realized that her life wasn't half bad after all. Work no longer got on her nerves, and cooking and cleaning were now rare occurrences. The boss's pictures revealed exactly what Brittany wanted to know. Fred, at 35, owned a sprawling mansion in the suburbs and collection of luxury cars. Brittany lounged back on the sofa, happily scrolling through outfit options for an upcoming date in her mind. Her ailing husband and the fact they were legally married didn't put a damper on her spirits one bit. The day arrived when Fred pulled up in his car to pick her up, and by morning, Brittany found herself waking up at her lover's place. Fred offered her coffee and suggested they hit up an exhibition in a couple of days. Brittany coquettishly agreed. Everything was falling into place, just as she had planned. At work, they made the decision to keep their relationship under wraps, though it was hard to hide anything in a female-dominated workplace. Before long, the entire office caught wind of the fact that the boss had a young mistress. The first day of April brought an unusual warmth. The sun seemed intent on coaxing all the plants to grow and bloom in just a single day. Mr. Finsterwald was busy adding a sturdy and smooth ramp to the porch. Beautiful day, huh? He remarked to Thomas, who sat in his wheelchair with the cat nestled on his lap, purring contentedly and kneading his sweater with its paws. Now we'll fix it up here. Give it a knock and you'll zip down like a racer, the elderly neighbor said cheerfully, brandishing a hammer. Yeah, but I'm not planning on breaking any traffic laws, Thomas replied with a smile. Lately, he'd been feeling a bit more upbeat, maybe thanks to the weather, or possibly because he'd finally come to grips with the fact that Brittany had practically abandoned him. Plus, Thomas had found a way to ease his loathed idleness. He decided to start writing a book about his extreme hobbies. Grabbing a blank notebook from his desk, he began jotting down ideas. Thomas had never written anything before, apart from school essays, but he approached the task with great enthusiasm. It's finished, Mr. Finsterwald exclaimed, surveying the completed work. Well, Thomas, give it a go on your own. Thomas gently steered his wheelchair down the makeshift ramp and then made his way up. Well, that's great, the elderly neighbor exclaimed. Hey, Grandpa! A voice called out from behind the fence. You there? Lunch is ready. I whipped up some soup and veggies. Thomas turned towards the sound. Behind the gate, a girl in a striped sweater waved eagerly. Her blonde curls spilled out from under her cap, and her bright blue eyes shone, even from a distance. That's my granddaughter, Violet. Mr. Finsterwald nodded subtly towards Thomas. She's here for the weekend. She's studying at the city university, doing her own thing. Grandpa, hurry up! Everything's gonna get cold, the girl insisted. I'm coming, coming! Why are you hollering? The elderly man grinned, waving good-natured at her. Send my regards to your mom. Catch you later. By the way, that beam under the roof here is bad. It would be good to fix it. Mr. Finsterwald packed up his tools in a bag, waved to Thomas, and headed outside the gate to join his granddaughter. April continued to be warm and calm. Thomas hadn't written to Brittany in a while, but he was diligently working on his book. He had already filled up the second notebook. Thomas, can you run to the store yourself? We're fresh out of salt, his mother called from the kitchen. I can't step away, or these pies will end up burnt. Getting to the grocery store was easy-peasy, just a straight shot down the asphalt path, about 250 meters long, with no steps to worry about at the entrance. Sure thing, Thomas replied enthusiastically. He swiftly threw on his jacket, double-checked his pocket for change, and rolled towards the gate, ready to lend a hand. The wheelchair's tires softly rustled on the already dry asphalt, as Thomas moved along, taking in the sights of the village. In the dull gray weather, it could be a bit depressing, 
But when the sun shone, the village sprang to life. Thomas made it to the store, grabbed the salt, and rolled his way back home smooth as butter. Just as he was about to reach his place, he heard a pitiful meow coming from the neighbor's roof and spotted his cat lounging up there. Thomas had noticed before that the cat used to climb up there using the scaffolding. The neighbors had been doing some repairs in the attic, and the scaffolding had been there all winter long. But now that the repairs were over, the scaffolding had been removed, leaving the poor cat trapped on the roof. There was no nearby tree, lower roof, or suitable fence for the cat to climb down from. How do I get you down now? That's a pickle. Thomas looked up at the cat with a puzzled expression. He tried knocking and calling out to the neighbors, but they weren't home. The familiar sense of helplessness and inadequacy washed over him once more. Poor cat, a familiar voice chimed in, interrupting Thomas's thoughts. Standing nearby was Mr. Finsterwald's granddaughter, squinting as she gazed up at the roof. Yeah, I'm figuring out how to rescue him. Thomas cautiously nodded in agreement. Yeah, we can't leave the little guy hanging, the girl said, placing a bag of food on Thomas's lap. Then she rolled up her sleeves and fearlessly climbed over the fence into the neighbor's yard. Violet scoured around the house and stumbled upon an old ladder in the shed. Although the ladder wasn't tall enough to reach the roof directly, it was sufficient to extend and snag the cat by its paw. Once the cat was rescued, Violet carefully handed him into Thomas's waiting hands. She then skillfully returned the ladder to its place and stealthily made her way out of the neighbor's yard, leaving no trace of their sudden intrusion. Thank you. I don't know how I would have managed it on my own, Thomas said gratefully, handing the girl the bag of groceries. My name's Violet, by the way, the girl introduced herself mid-conversation. Otherwise, you might have had to wait for another compassionate passerby. I'm Thomas, the young man replied, feeling a bit sheepish. Let me give you a hand, Violet offered, opening the gate so Thomas could pass through effortlessly. She took an awkward step and stumbled over the curb. Thomas's reflexes kicked in, and he swiftly leaned forward to catch Violet in his arms. Oh, I'm such a klutz, she exclaimed, laughing to cover her embarrassment. Don't sweat it, it happens, Thomas reassured her with a smile. Violet, why not swing by with Mr. Finsterwald sometime? We can have a nice cup of tea together. Sure thing, we'll come by. Grandpa was just mentioning something about the roof, Violet recalled, nodding in agreement. She waved goodbye, and for some reason, Thomas felt an unexpected surge of joy, like that of a child. He wheeled the chair onto the porch, opened the door to the house, and the hungry cat immediately darted inside. It was only then that Thomas realized what had happened just a minute ago. It was the first time since the accident that he felt any sensation in his legs. Brittany stretched out on the bed, basking in the rays of sunlight streaming through the window. The clock indicated it was around 10 in the morning. Ned was nowhere to be seen. He always left early except on weekends. Work was the chief priority in the life of the head of a real estate agency. Yet, Brittany was contemplating resigning from her job. She felt irked that Fred hadn't proposed it himself, particularly given their relationship and his ability to support her financially. Whenever her colleagues called with inquiries about showing apartments to buyers, Brittany always made excuses. She was feeling unwell, tied up with other commitments, or had an urgent business trip. If he doesn't make the offer, then I should resign myself, Brittany resolved, while waiting for the coffee machine to brew. She found Fred's house much more appealing than her husband's apartment. It was tranquil, roomy, and equipped with all modern conveniences. A robotic vacuum cleaner and a dishwasher were among the automated appliances, streamlining household tasks to the fullest. The house was consistently pristine. Fred arranged for a cleaning service to thoroughly tidy up once a week. Unlike Thomas, 
who wasn't as particular about cleanliness, Fred maintained impeccable grooming standards and abhorred any sign of dirt or disorder. Brittany found herself drawn to Fred's lifestyle and the level of comfort and refinement it offered, envisioning it as the life she desired for herself. Having successfully secured her position as Fred's mistress, Brittany's next objective was to gradually integrate herself into his personal life and space, aiming to become indispensable to him over time. Brittany's aspirations were grand, as she found herself eyeing Fred's sports car, contemplating the necessity of a fur coat for the upcoming season, and strategizing the perfect timing for a vacation. Her plans were nothing short of ambitious. Brittany enjoyed a leisurely breakfast, took her time with a refreshing shower, expertly applied her makeup, hailed a cab, and set off for work with an air of confidence. You're arriving at work as if it's a holiday, the manager greeted her, raising an eyebrow in mild surprise. I'm not going to work here anymore, Brittany informed her, placing her resignation letter in front of her. Hmm, so you're leaving us to go freelance. Or have you found a better job? The manager asked as she put the resignation letter in a folder. You could say that, Brittany replied with a mysterious smile. She swiftly collected her belongings from the desk, bid her colleagues a brief farewell, and hurried out onto the street. It's impressive how determined Brittany became when the opportunity for a relationship with a wealthy man arose. Brittany got back home, ditched her work stuff, and hit the shops. She figured splurging on some sexy lingerie might sweeten the news of her quitting for Ned. Later that evening, Brittany met up with her lover at his place and broke the news to him. He was taken aback. You quit your job, but why? You didn't seem too overwhelmed, and you always got your paycheck on time. Brittany playfully settled into his lap to have more time with you, darling. After all, a well-rested, happy, and satisfied woman is much better than an exhausted one. Well, that's true, but what made you think you were worn out? Fred asked, genuinely puzzled. That's just how I felt, Brittany replied with a shrug. Brittany wasn't pleased with her lover's reaction. An awkward silence ensued, but the man was the first to break it. I also wanted to discuss the holiday in May with you. I was thinking maybe we could head to the mountains, rent a cozy secluded house. What do you think? When the mountains were mentioned, Brittany's expression soured. She was weary of the mountains in her life with Thomas. Fred, why don't we ditch the chilly mountains and go somewhere warmer? How about a beach vacation instead of trudging through the woods? Sound good? Brittany felt a sense of triumph as Fred agreed to her suggestion, realizing she had gotten her way. Thomas eagerly looked forward to the tea party with his neighbors, seeing it as a significant event. The return of some sensation in his legs reignited his hopes of flying again, or at least being able to walk on the grass under his own power. Thomas opened a folder containing the doctor's prescriptions carefully studied the instructions for therapeutic physical training, and began to exercise slowly. His mother couldn't help but shed a tear of joy as she watched her son practice. Time will come, and everything will work out as needed. She would sometimes reassure herself in the evenings, the soft clacking of her knitting needles providing a comforting rhythm. On a balmy afternoon in mid-April, Mr. Finsterwald and Violet appeared at their doorstep. The hostess extended an invitation to join them inside, but the elderly gentleman politely declined, stating that duty should precede leisure and tea could wait until later. He examined the roof's edge carefully, then got down to business. Mrs. Ehrlers initially hovered around, offering assistance, but eventually bid them farewell and retreated to the kitchen to prepare dinner. Thomas and Violet took their seats on the porch platform, prepared to lend a hand to Mr. Finsterwald should he require any tools or assistance. Your grandpa's something else, Violet, Thomas said. I barely remember mine, 
I was just a kid when he passed away. I'm pretty lucky, Violet nodded, a smile playing on her lips as she glanced at her grandfather, who was diligently hammering away. He's quite the role model for us all, isn't he? It's quite evident, Thomas nodded in agreement. You probably take after him quite a bit. Violet tilted her head mischievously and glanced up at Thomas. In what way? she asked with anticipation, her eyes fixed on Thomas. For some reason, Thomas felt a flush of embarrassment, his heart racing. This simple and lively girl stirred up emotions in him, akin to the exhilaration of his first paragliding flight. You're laid back, witty, and kind-hearted, Thomas blurted out. She chuckled and gently patted Thomas's shoulder. Tea's ready, everyone, Mrs. Ehrlers announced from the doorway. Enough work on the roof, Mr. Finsterwald. You two come in, too. The dumplings are ready and piping hot. Mrs. Ehrlers, all you think about is food. Some people might have work to do in the middle of the day, replied the elderly neighbor, engrossed in his task with the pliers. Grandpa, stop grumbling. Let's go. Everything will get cold. Violet gently scolded him. She grabbed the handles of the wheelchair and confidently pushed it towards the entrance. Protesting, Thomas said. What are you doing? Don't worry, I can manage. Oh, let me take care of you. Violet giggled, continuing to push the wheelchair. When the two of them went to wash their hands at the back of the house, Mrs. Ehrlers slowed down the neighbor who was following and whispered, there's something beautiful starting to blossom. I'm not blind. I can see it, Mr. Finsterwald mumbled in reply, and the neighbors shared knowing smiles. When they sat down to eat, they found a feast waiting for them. Delicious homemade dumplings filled with garden cherries, along with strong tea and creamy sour cream. As they finished up, Violet quietly slipped a dumpling to the cat. Who's giving the cat food from the table? Mrs. Ehrlers exclaimed with surprise. Why don't you send them for a walk as punishment? The grandfather winked at the woman. Violet and Thomas looked at each other at the same time. That sounds fun, Mrs. Ehrlers chimed in. It's such nice weather outside. Go enjoy and bring back some fresh flowers. There's a patch of primroses behind the village near the pond. After they finished eating, Violet and Thomas strolled along the road at a relaxed pace. Thomas, can you walk at all? Violet asked suddenly, then quickly apologized. I'm sorry, that was inappropriate of me to ask. It's okay, Thomas replied calmly. The doctors say there's a chance, but for now, no, I can't walk at all. I've started doing exercises to regain sensation. But sometimes I feel overwhelmed by apathy, and I'm tempted to give up and accept things as they are. They say human potential knows no bounds, and it's all about determination, Violet remarked, glancing at the sun before turning to Thomas. I believe that eventually you'll be back on your feet. They chatted about paragliding and tourists, about the flaws of student housing and teachers, about the blend of rural life in the city about life's pleasures and everyday hassles. It was the first time in many months since the accident that Thomas felt truly alive. Suddenly, the wheelchair jolted as it hit a rock, prompting Thomas to let out a yelp. Violet halted abruptly. Are you okay? Did that hurt? No, he replied, his expression a mix of surprise and joy. But I think I felt something in my leg. Violet's eyes got big as she crouched next to him. She softly pressed his leg just above the knee. Thomas felt a tiny, dull feeling, like touching something through a thick blanket. It wasn't much, but he felt it. I feel it, he whispered. I definitely feel it. Violet jumped up, laughing, and hurried to hug Thomas. A tear trickled down his cheek, a mix of joy and happiness. Brittany was nodding off in her seat, headphones on, 
while Fred sat beside her, engrossed in something on his laptop. Through the airplane window, clouds drifted by as they headed home from their vacation. Brittany felt content. During their time abroad, she had persuaded her lover to purchase her some pricey gifts. Meanwhile, Fred never brought up the topic of living together, but Brittany truly believed it would happen eventually. As the couple relaxed after the morning flight, sipping coffee on the balcony, Brittany's eyes lingered once more on Fred's sports car. I was thinking, maybe I could borrow your sports car. Why do you need it? Fred asked, looking at her curiously, momentarily shifting his attention away from his phone screen and work emails. Well, darling, I was thinking, wouldn't it be fabulous if I could use your sleek sports car? Brittany purred, her fingers dancing in the air. I mean, a girl's got to run errands and hit the gym. And you know how heels don't quite cut it for those things. Just throw on some sneakers or boots. They're way comfier, Fred shrugged. Plus, it's a lot simpler than getting another car. Why bother buying a car when we already have one? Brittany gestured towards the sleek blue vehicle. Fred glanced at the car and replied after a moment, That car isn't exactly beginner-friendly. I'm waiting for a new trade-in deal to get a new one. Plus, you don't have any driving experience. We can sell it later, Brittany insisted. I can always learn to drive. Brittany knew how to ask until she got what she wanted. She figured out in high school that it was easier than making an effort. If things got awkward, she could always smooth them over later with her feminine charm. So. Fred squeezed Brittany's fingers irritably. The car isn't budging an inch from where it is. Just get yourself a good pair of sneakers instead. Fred got up, grabbed the mug of leftover coffee, and headed to his study, signaling that the discussion was over. Brittany grinned with a hint of annoyance. She felt slighted by the suggestion, recalling that her stylish shoes and high heels had initially captured her lover's attention. She remembered the kind and patient Thomas, who couldn't give her a car, but never refused her other modest whims. A few days went by. She prepared a sumptuous dinner, selected a fine wine, and intended to broach the subject of the car once more. The evening passed in a cozy atmosphere until Fred suggested watching a new movie. On the screen, a tranquil scene portrayed a family with two children. The father tossed a frisbee with his son, while the mother guided her daughter through a piano lesson. A golden retriever was snoozing on the mat. I've always dreamed of having a big family, Fred suddenly remarked. A son and a daughter would be perfect. I worked hard to build this business so my kids could have everything they need. Brittany, lying on his lap, listened intently. So, this was Fred's ideal vision of a wife an educated, working mother. But that wasn't what she wanted. Why waste her youth and beauty on children when there were so many other pleasures to enjoy? Out of the blue, a light bulb lit up above her head. A few days later, as they were enjoying their breakfast, Brittany suddenly bolted from the table and dashed to the restroom in a panic. Hey, everything okay? Fred's concerned voice echoed through the closed bathroom door. Just suddenly feeling dizzy and nauseous, Brittany groaned, her voice echoing from the bathroom. Fred's eyes sparkled with a mix of joy and anticipation as he waited outside the bathroom door. Maybe you're pregnant. It seems quite obvious, Fred exclaimed, lifting her gently and settling her on the living room couch, then started fanning her. If I am, would you be happy? Brittany asked feigning innocence with a sly smile. Are you kidding? Of course, Fred replied, his face lighting up with excitement. I've wanted kids for so long. Okay, I'll go to the doctor tomorrow and find out everything, she sighed, wrapping her arms around the jubilant Fred. Brittany had already devised a plan to simulate pregnancy until her belly started to show. Nausea, mood swings, dizziness, and sudden cravings were all part of the act.
Shortly after, Brittany obtained a familiar doctor's note confirming her pregnancy. Fred was ecstatic, bustling with activity, and had already picked out a name for their future child. He swiftly relocated Brittany to his residence. During the evenings, he tirelessly browsed through strollers and cribs, engaging in endless discussions about all things related to children. Brittany concealed her true sentiments and sought an opportunity to initiate divorce proceedings with Thomas, enabling her to freely marry Fred. With time ticking away, every passing day became increasingly crucial. Violet only visited the village on weekends, as she had classes during the week. Thomas missed her presence, but remained dedicated to his riding and leg exercises. Violet encouraged him in both pursuits, fostering his enthusiasm. Through a month of diligent exercises, Thomas achieved the milestone of being able to move his toes. Within another two weeks, he progressed to being able to tilt his foot slightly and tense his lower leg. Each new accomplishment fueled his motivation and reignited his will to live. One day, as Thomas sat in his wheelchair on the porch, basking in the sunlight, with his eyes closed, he felt someone's hands gently covering his eyelids. Violet, you thought you could sneak up on me without me noticing? Thomas chuckled, recognizing her touch. I thought I could catch you off guard, Violet teased, playfully tickling Thomas. His laughter filled the air, dispelling any remnants of drowsiness. Mrs. Ehrlers chuckled at the scene before joining them inside for tea as the sun dipped below the horizon. At the table, while Thomas's mother busied herself with the jam, Thomas discreetly placed his hand on Violet's. She glanced at him, blushing slightly, but allowed his hand to rest there. It felt like a nostalgic throwback to their early dates for Thomas. Mrs. Ehrlers noticed the interaction at the table, but chose not to acknowledge it. Instead, she excused herself with a sudden need to attend to something outside and swiftly left the kitchen. Violet, can we chat for a moment? Thomas started once he noticed they were alone. Sure, what's on your mind? Violet asked, pivoting fully on her stool to face him. I wanted to talk about us, Thomas began, squeezing her hand gently. You've become so important to me, especially during this tough time. I know my situation isn't ideal. I'm still legally married, and I understand if that's a deal-breaker for you, but I just wanted to express how much your support means to me. Violet responded by embracing him tightly, her arms wrapped around his neck. I need you no matter what, she whispered, and I believe you'll break free from that wheelchair soon. What matters most to me is how you feel, not what's written on some papers. The man smiled warmly and returned the hug. Let's get you back on your feet, okay? Violet said with determination, planting a kiss on his cheek. Then everything else will fall into place. Another day in the living room. Are you certain? Violet gazed at Thomas with genuine concern. Perhaps it's better to hold off for now? Yes, absolutely, Thomas affirmed, mustering all his strength as he leaned on the arm of the chair. It's high time we gave it a shot. Violet rose from her seat and extended her arms towards Thomas. He tentatively began to rise, first propping himself up on his elbows. His legs complied, though they felt feeble, possessing only a fraction of the strength of a healthy person. His knees creaked like the hinges of a long-neglected door. Is it tough? Violet watched him intently. It's a bit challenging. Thomas admitted, his voice tinged with exertion, but I'm determined to make progress. As he stood there, doubts crept into his mind, but he pushed them aside, focusing on the sensation of his feet touching the ground. With closed eyes, Thomas recalled his first paragliding adventure, the sensation of soaring through the clouds and the thrill of skimming over tree-covered slopes. Encouraged by the supportive presence of Violet, he summoned the courage to take a step forward. Struggling against the foreign sensation in his leg, Thomas persisted, slowly moving it forward with sheer determination. 
With each step, supported by Violet's encouragement, he managed to take a couple of feeble strides before wearily returning to his chair. You're amazing, Violet hugged him tightly. Let's go to the doctor and document your progress. Maybe they can give us some recommendations to speed up the process. What they had discussed was put into action, and a few days later, they found themselves sitting in the doctor's office. Your progress is truly remarkable, exclaimed the doctor after examining Thomas. At this rate, you could be running in just six months. I've never seen patients recover so quickly from such injuries. It's remarkable progress, although we don't typically use the term miracle in scientific contexts, the doctor continued. Keep up with your exercises and work on restoring mobility to all parts of your leg. I suggest trying to walk with support. Feeling inspired, Thomas drove back home, his confidence growing in this hopeful state of mind. Just as he arrived, he received an unexpected phone call. Hi, Thomas, Brittany's voice came through the receiver. I won't take up too much of your time. Can we talk? Hey, what's up? His chest tightened with memories that had almost faded away. Well, just wanted to let you know, I've filed for divorce, Brittany said in a matter-of-fact tone. I don't think I need to spell out the reasons. You're a smart guy. You'll get it. That's fine, Thomas replied simply. Good. I hope it can be finalized quickly. I'll vacate your apartment in a couple of weeks. Goodbye, Brittany hung up. Okay, got it. Thanks for letting me know. Take care. Thomas said, before Brittany ended the call. Violet overheard the conversation. She turned to Thomas and whispered, It's for the best. Don't be upset. You said yourself that your marriage was just a formality. Yeah, you're right, Thomas replied, trying to shake off the remnants of emotion. It's just a bit surreal, you know? I did love her once. Brittany felt a sense of satisfaction as she tapped her fingers on the armrest of her chair. Everything was unfolding just as she had planned. Thomas had agreed to the divorce, albeit reluctantly, but she knew he didn't have much choice. And as for Fred, he adored her. With the pregnancy confirmed by a certificate, Brittany now had her own bank card with enough money to fulfill any desire at any time. It was perfect. What more could she want? She felt like a queen with everyone she had manipulated in her pursuit of the perfect life dancing to her tune. In the evening, when Fred returned home, he first embraced Brittany and gently stroked her belly. She prepared a delicious dinner, poured wine, and gave him a relaxing massage. As Fred began to unwind, Brittany seized the opportunity to broach the subject. Fred, I really want our kid to have both of us officially. I grew up in a full house, and I can't imagine it any other way. Yeah, I've been thinking about it too, Fred nodded. Fred reached into his briefcase and pulled out a jewelry box, placing it gently into Brittany's hands. I wanted to do this in a more formal way, but since we're discussing it now, why wait? Agreed, Brittany exclaimed throwing her arms around Fred while marveling at the size of the stone in the ring. They decided to get married in three months. By the time of the wedding, Brittany planned to finalize her divorce from her ex-husband. And after the ceremony, she would fake a miscarriage. The trap would close securely and on time. Brittany realized it was time to push harder. She rested her head on her lover's chest and said, Fred, when my belly gets big, it will be difficult for me to get to the doctor and take care of other things. Maybe you'll reconsider getting a car for me. I could take a few lessons with an instructor to refresh my knowledge. What do you think? Brittany suggested coyly. Maybe what you're saying makes sense, Fred pondered, scratching his chin. Brittany held her breath, waiting eagerly for his response. All right, he finally said. But let's switch things up. I'll sell my car and get you something more girly. How's that sound? Absolutely great. Thank you, darling. Brittany squealed with delight and started hugging Fred again. You're welcome, my dear, 
Fred chuckled, returning her embrace. Thomas, it's about time you went downtown and cleared out that scoundrel's belongings from the apartment, Mrs. Ehrlers said firmly, setting a steaming bowl of soup in front of her son. You've been divorced for two weeks now, and you're still dragging your feet. Mom, I'm not sure if I can handle it, Thomas replied hesitantly. Over the past month, Thomas had made significant strides in rehabilitating his legs. He could now stand and sit with assistance and even walk slowly around the house with the help of crutches. Then why don't you call Violet? She goes to town every Monday anyway, and she'll lend you a hand, suggested Mrs. Ehrlers, taking a seat across from him at the table. It's not ideal for me. She's already here assisting me all the time, mumbled Thomas. Son, this girl cares for you deeply. Unlike that socialite, don't let her slip away. Girls like her are priceless. We all make mistakes, but that doesn't mean you can't give it another shot, Mrs. Ehrlers advised, placing her hand on his palm. Thomas finished his soup, then pulled out his phone and dialed Violet's number. Hey, I was thinking, would you be up for heading into town with me sometime soon? Maybe to take a look at the apartment. Thomas asked, twirling his spoon nervously. Sure, I'm up for it, Violet agreed. But are you sure you're ready to manage without the wheelchair? I believe I should be fine, Thomas reassured her. Great, Violet's voice brightened. I'll be all set for Saturday. I'm excited too. See you then, Thomas muttered to himself as he ended the call prematurely. His cheeks flushed with embarrassment, realizing he missed the chance to express himself fully. It would have surprised him to know that Violet, holding her phone in the midst of the university, felt just as he did. He'd be blown away to learn that Violet felt the same way, standing there in the heart of the university with her phone in hand. I ditched class to come with you, Violet admitted, once they were settled on the commuter train. Thomas looked at her with surprise. It was the first time he'd opted not to use a wheelchair, relying solely on crutches. Why? he asked. Instead of giving a straight answer, Violet planted a kiss on his cheek. He grinned in the cozy, sleepy vibe of the train, closed his eyes, and pulled Violet into a tighter hug. As Thomas walked into the apartment, memories flooded back, along with a familiar scent hanging in the air. Pausing at the doorway, he took a moment to breathe it in, evoking memories of past adventures and travels. In the corner of the balcony closet sat his paraglider, snug in its case, surrounded by his other gear, a pair of trusty tracking boots, a camera for snapping aerial shots, and a helmet. Brittany's stuff was nowhere to be seen. She had cleared out entirely, leaving behind only faint traces of her presence. It seemed she hadn't even bothered to tidy up before departing. Deciding to order takeout, Thomas and Violet tackled the cleanup together. While Thomas did what he could, taking breaks when needed, Violet took charge, sprucing up the bathroom, washing the dusty dishes, vacuuming the floor, and wiping down the mirrors with brisk efficiency. You're really kicking butt with your recovery, Violet cheered as they sank into the living room couch, munching on sandwiches and sipping tea. The doc was right about you. You're getting better by the day. Hey, I'm just fueled by determination, Thomas quipped, giving Violet a playful wink. She chuckled, nearly dropping her sausage in her lap. Seriously, though, I'm so grateful for everything you're doing for me, Thomas said, sliding a piece of his sandwich onto Violet's plate. But I've got this burning desire to get back up in the sky. I miss flying like crazy. Violet raised an eyebrow, recalling Thomas's previous injury and the car accident. Aren't you worried about hurting your back again? She asked, her concern evident. Truth be told, I'd go through it all over again, Thomas replied, his eyes sparkling with determination. Why's that? Violet asked, her curiosity piqued. To get to know you all over again, Thomas said, with a mischievous grin, leaning in for a quick kiss. 
Brittany sat in the cafe, eagerly devouring her pasta during lunch with her friend. They had spent the morning visiting a dozen wedding salons, searching for the perfect dress for Brittany and her bridesmaids. With the venue, photographer and presenter already chosen, the menu finalized, and invitations sent out to guests, everything was falling into place for the big day. Getting tired of faking that baby bump, Brittany's friend slurped her juice. Exhausted, but what's a girl to do? Brittany smirked. You've snagged yourself quite the catch with Ned, her friend chirped. Handsome, loaded, everything your old pilot wasn't. Don't even get me started, Brittany sighed, pushing her plate away. That guy was still hiking in the mountains in his thirties. But hey, ancient history now, divorced and dusted. So, when's the big do date? Her friend winked, nodding at Brittany's belly. And where are you getting those fake papers to fool Fred? Supposed to be popping in the fifth month. Eating like a champ. Already packed on three kilos. How am I going to ditch this baby weight later? Just one more week of faking it, then it's time for the miscarriage show. Brittany smirked. Jessie, my aunt's friend, is sorting it all out today. Gotta pay her a visit. You're ballsy and crafty, girl, Brittany's friend grinned. Wouldn't dare pull off what you're doing. It's all about survival, babe, Brittany shrugged. The girls split the lunch tab and went their separate ways. Brittany hopped into her flashy red sedan while her friend waited for a cab. In 30 minutes, she found herself in the doctor's office, their chat interrupted by a phone call. Hey, babe, where are you? Fred's voice came through. I'm at the docks. I'll be home soon, Brittany replied sweetly. Awesome. Thinking of whipping up some risotto. Ask if you can have some, because there's wine in the recipe, Fred requested. Sure thing. See you soon. Brittany, unaware she was still on the line, tapped and slipped into her purse it. He's all concerned about the baby, she chuckled. Well, why not? You could really be prego, and you've got the perfect guy for it. Hire a nanny, keep up appearances, bam, instant social status, Jessie chimed in. Brittany made a face, like she'd tasted something sour. Come on, I'm already dreading the baby weight. What if I blow up like a balloon? Stretch marks? Swollen feet? C-section? No thanks. Maybe one day, but not now. Hey, it's your call, but I'd do it for a catch like Fred, Jesse grinned. So, what's on the agenda? Sixteen-week ultrasound, Brittany said. I'll rustle up someone who's recently had one. With a few clicks, Jesse had the documents ready. Brittany slipped them into her bag and handed over an envelope to Jessie. Got your wedding outfit sorted yet? Brittany asked. Yup, checked out a few options. I'll cash in on your gratitude for them, Jessie quipped. Their laughter echoed through the office. Brittany stepped into the house with a spring in her step. The air smelled of home-cooked meals instead of the usual Italian fare and an unusual quiet hung in the atmosphere, devoid of the usual clattering of pots and pans in the kitchen. She found Fred sitting somberly in the living room. Decided to switch it up and order in tonight, Brittany attempted a light-hearted quip. Fred's gaze met hers, heavy with seriousness. Give me the car keys. Confusion creased Brittany's brow. Why? she asked, puzzled. Fred drew a deep breath, then let it out slowly. Hand over the keys now, then go pack your things in the bedroom, call a cab, and get out of my life, he commanded, his voice cold and resolute. Brittany recoiled, her eyes brimming with tears. Fred, what's going on? And tell your doctor that I'll make sure she loses her license, or better yet, I'll sue her. Fred's tone was cutting, his eyes boring into hers. Brittany collapsed onto the carpet the weight of reality crashing down on her like a ton of bricks. Fred knelt beside her, gripping her chin to meet his gaze. You thought you could use me for your own gain, didn't you? And all because of a half-baked phone call. Quite the inconvenience, huh? 
Fred's words pierced through Brittany like shards of ice, and she dissolved into a flood of shame-filled tears. The memory of that evening remained shrouded in a haze for Brittany. She hurriedly stuffed her belongings into suitcases and bags within a mere 15 minutes, knowing any attempt at apology would be futile. The embittered real estate mogul watched silently, sipping his wine and tossing sarcastic remarks her way as she frantically gathered her things. Before leaving, he reclaimed every expensive gift he'd bestowed upon her. Watches, jewelry, branded items, all returned. With nothing but the possessions she'd arrived with months prior, Brittany walked out of the gate, her pride in tatters. So are you ready? Violet asked, her grip firm on Thomas's hands. Absolutely, ready to take flight, Thomas exclaimed, a grin spreading across his face as he adjusted his helmet. The paraglider runway stretched out before them, framed by the breathtaking autumn scenery. The mountains painted a vivid picture with hues of ochre and scarlet blending into the landscape. It was late September and the beauty of nature was in full display. Just remember when you land, keep your feet up until we catch you, Mark advised, making final adjustments to Thomas's straps. Don't worry, I've got this. Mike, the instructor, chimed in from behind the passenger cradle. I'll be guiding you today. All right, let's get going, Thomas said eagerly, grabbing hold of the safety harness and taking a step forward. Violet gasped as the paraglider caught the wind and began to ascend, swaying gently in the air. Thomas shielded his eyes from the sun and nodded in approval. Looks like he's doing great, Thomas said with a smile. I can't help but worry, Violet admitted, nervously fidgeting with her fingers. Don't worry, Mike knows what he's doing. He'll bring him back safely, Thomas reassured her, giving her shoulder a comforting pat. Violet glanced up at the paraglider, which was steadily climbing higher into the sky. Let's head down to the landing area, Thomas suggested, gesturing for her to follow him. And when will you take to the skies? I'll wait until Thomas is fully recovered, Violet replied. I trust him the most. Plus, it's so peaceful and beautiful here. She took a deep breath, savoring the crisp autumn air. Mark chuckled. You haven't experienced real adventure until you've gone rafting or quad biking in the mud. That's where the true excitement lies. After a lively conversation, they arrived at the lower site, where tents were set up with thermoses of herbal tea and sandwiches. Over the past summer, Thomas and Violet's lives had undergone significant changes. They sold their city apartment and purchased a smaller one further from the downtown. With the remaining funds, they launched a company specializing in adventure travel. Violet took charge of the company's administrative tasks, managing advertising, phone calls, and paperwork. Though Thomas wasn't able to work as an instructor, yet due to his ongoing recovery, he enthusiastically shared his knowledge of the best destinations with travelers and happily signed copies of his book for the most curious visitors. The most notable change occurred in Violet and Thomas's relationship. They were now officially a couple. They chose not to have a lavish wedding with expensive gifts or traditional attire. Instead, they spent quality time with loved ones before heading to the mountains that same evening. By the time of their informal wedding celebration, Thomas had made significant progress in his recovery and no longer relied on crutches or a wheelchair. He only used a cane. It's great to be back here. Everything feels just like old times, Mark exclaimed with satisfaction. Almost, Violet gently corrected him. Apologies all around, Mark offered with a gesture of contrition. Suddenly, Thomas's phone, which was in Mark's pocket, rang. Mark swiftly took out the device and answered the call. Hi! No, it's not Thomas. He's flying. Mark winked at Violet, who listened intently to the playful conversation. How's he flying? Just like before, he's fully recovered. What? I think that's an irrelevant question. He's already married and deeply in love. Bye. Mark ended the call and pocketed the phone. Who was that? Violet asked, curious about the conversation. 
Just someone passing by, Mark waved off, leaping up as Thomas's landing approached. They're coming! Catch him! Violet joined Mark in rushing to greet Thomas as he touched down safely with Mike's assistance. Thomas lay on the grass, looking up at the sky with a contented smile. Alive? Violet asked, laughing. Alive! Alive than ever! Thomas exclaimed, brimming with happiness.